So when we talked about the fluid mosaic structure, I did mention that the membrane is actually made out of the phospholipid bilayer and also proteins. So in this particular video, we are going to further elaborate on the structure of a membrane. If a question asks you to draw out a fluid mosaic membrane structure, it may come out in paper two, by the way. They have asked this question. The first thing the examiners want you to draw is the phospholipid bilayer. You will have to show the polar phosphate heads facing outwards and the nonpolar fatty acid tails facing each other, forming the bilayer. And a very important thing to also mention is the phospholipid bilayer has a width of 7 nanometers. That's just a reminder. I did mention this in a previous video, but it's good to also just mention it again that the width is about 7 nanometers. So after that, what we also have to do is if this is a eukaryotic cell, you will have to put in the structure of the cholesterol. And remember, the cholesterol has a polar head and one nonpolar tail, and the arrangement is also similar to the phospholipid. What I like to do is I usually like to put at least two cholesterol molecules, one at the upper layer of the phospholipid and one on the lower layer on the phospholipid. And the orientation has to be the same as well, where the polar head is facing outwards and the nonpolar tail is facing uh, inwards because that's where the hydrophobic interaction happens. The third important thing to look at is something known as membrane proteins. Now, there are two types of membrane proteins in the fluid mosaic membrane structure, and they are divided into something known as the intrinsic and extrinsic proteins. Intrinsic proteins are proteins that are fully or partially in the membrane, and extrinsic proteins are not embedded in the membrane at all. So the first protein I'm drawing there, as you can see, it's occupying half the bilayer, so it's partially in the membrane, therefore it is an intrinsic protein. The second one fully encompasses the width of the membrane, and therefore it is fully in the membrane, so it is an intrinsic protein as well. The third protein that I'm drawing, if you can see that, it's kind of attached to the membrane, but it's kind of, it's on the surface of the membrane. Okay, it's on the upper surface of the membrane or the lower surface of the membrane. They are not within the membrane itself. They're just kind of like floating on the surfaces of the phospholipid bilayer. Therefore, we call them extrinsic proteins. So, of course, then we have to talk about the question here. What exactly are the functions of these intrinsic or extrinsic proteins? You see, there are so many functions that the membrane proteins may have, but what we're going to do is we're going to see at least four to five of them that you are required to know for the exam. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to draw out a phospholipid bilayer. You can see the cholesterol in orange, and I'm drawing out like these purple proteins, are these purple structures within the membrane. And some students will go, oh, you are only drawing the intrinsic proteins. What about the extrinsic proteins? We don't have to focus so much on the extrinsic ones. The intrinsic ones are sufficient for the exam. So another very important thing to also know is the blue color layer at the bottom, I'm representing the cytoplasm. Uh, and the, on the top part of this diagram, you can see the outside of the cell. So this phospholipid bilayer is the cell surface membrane. Why is it referred to as the cell surface membrane? Because it is separating the outside of the cell and also the inside of the cell, which is the cytoplasm. So some possible function of the proteins are as follows. They may act as something known as transport proteins. You see, sometimes due to the nature of the phospholipid bilayer, what may happen is substances or particles cannot pass through this bilayer. We will elaborate on this in, in the next video, but what I want you to know is sometimes some particles cannot directly pass through the bilayer. So to solve that problem, some of these membrane proteins may act as something known as a transport protein. And a transport protein allows these particles to easily pass through either by a process known as diffusion or 
active transport. We will elaborate on this in the next video. So some membrane proteins can act as transport proteins to move substances across the membrane. That's what they can do. Other possible functions of the membrane protein is they can act as a receptor protein. A receptor protein is just a protein to receive a signaling molecule, for example, hormones. See, hormones can travel in the blood from one particular organ to another organ. And hormones are just a way of different parts of the body to communicate with each other. So if the hormone is about to travel to a cell, another cell captures or catches the hormone by allowing it to bind to the receptor protein. And as you can see there, the hormone and the receptor protein have complementary shapes so that they can bind to each other. Some membrane proteins are not just proteins, but they are referred to as something known as glycoproteins. As you can see there, this kind of like orange uh, branching of this weird antler or uh, this weird branching happening on the protein. And this is referred to as a glycoprotein because the orange, uh, because the yellow branches are referred to as the carbohydrate chain, that's the glyco part, and the protein, which is the purple part, is called, well, it's called protein. So together, they are referred to as something known as glycoproteins, and they are synthesized by an organelle in your cell known as the Golgi apparatus. Going back to chapter one, as a reminder for you, the Golgi apparatus, it's a single membrane-bound organelle in eukaryotic cells. They are made out of stacked curved membranes and the function of the Golgi body is to modify proteins and one example of protein modification is to take the protein and carbohydrate and join them together to become something known as glycoproteins. An example of glycoprotein that I mentioned in chapter one was mucus and another example is a membrane protein as you can see here. So you see, something that we studied in chapter one a long time ago is still relevant in chapter four. One function of this glycoprotein is they can act as something known as receptor protein, where they can also receive signaling molecules such as hormones. And the hormone that I've drawn out in red is complementary to the glycoprotein. That's what it is. So these two receptor proteins are pretty interesting because the receptor protein on the left is just a protein molecule which is complementary to a hormone, but the, but the receptor protein on the right is actually a glycoprotein where it has this extra branch known as the carbohydrate chain, which also helps to capture complementary and different types of hormones. So that's what it is. Before I go into the third function, I also want you to understand that glycoproteins and another weird thing that I'm drawing here, known as glycolipid. Yes, I know that the glycolipid is not a protein, but I'm just including this in the video. Uh, a glycoprotein is just a protein with a carbohydrate chain. A glycolipid is a phospholipid with a carbohydrate chain. Now, what I want you to understand is glycoproteins and glycolipids may have another function, which is known as cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Now, it is not important for you to internalize or completely understand this for now because cell-to-cell -cell recognition is more relevant in chapter 11 when we are studying immunity. But I will want to explain cell-to-cell -cell recognition just a little bit to give you a bit of a uh, flavor for chapter 11. You see, the most significant importance of cell-to-cell -cell recognition is for immune response. What do I mean by that? Going back to O-level revision, what I want you to know is inside your body, you have this particular uh, cell known as lymphocytes. A lymphocyte is a type of white blood cell. What is the function of white blood cell? White blood cells are there to defend your body against uh, harmful microorganisms. So, for example, you have a lymphocyte. I'm going to draw out my white blood cell, my red blood cell, and a bacterial pathogen, which is something harmful in the body. You have your lymphocyte, so your lymphocyte is supposed to defend your body against harmful things. So, which cell will it attack? Will it attack, uh, will my white blood cell attack my red blood cell or will it attack the bacterial pathogen? 
Of course, most students will say, well, it will not attack the red blood cell. It will just attack the pathogen, right? But the question is, how does the white blood cell know that it should not attack the red blood cell? How does it know that, oh, I need to attack the bacterial pathogen because that's the dangerous one? Most students will say, well, the red blood cell is not harmful, but the bacterium is harmful. But that's not exactly what is happening. You see, lymphocytes will only react to something and attack it due to the presence of antigens. So what exactly are antigens anyway? You see, on the surface of my red blood cell, I have glycoproteins. And when the lymphocyte looks at the glycoprotein, the lymphocyte goes, oh, the shape of this glycoprotein is familiar to me. It is something that belongs in the body. Therefore, I will not attack it. I know this, and therefore, I will not attack it. However, what happens is when the lymphocyte sees or detects the glycoprotein on the bacterium, look at the shape of the glycoprotein. The shape of the glycoprotein is different. And the white blood cell, the lymphocyte goes, this is different. I do not know this, this particular shape. Therefore, this shape is foreign to me. It is different. And because it is different, I will have to attack it. Glycoproteins or glycolipids which are foreign or different to us are referred to as antigens. And this will affect cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So coming back again, if my white blood cell looks at a familiar shape on the glycoprotein, it will say that, ah, this is my friend or this belongs to me. But if it looks at a foreign or different glycoprotein or glycolipid for that matter, it will attack it because it is the enemy. That is what cell-to-cell -cell recognition is. Cell-to-cell -cell recognition enables your white blood cells to distinguish what is familiar or friendly and what is different or the enemy. The other final function of the membrane proteins is they can also act as enzymes. Enzymes, if you remember in chapter 3, they just reduce activation energy by binding to the substrates temporarily, forming the enzyme substrate complex, and converting it into products. That's basically it. So these are the four functions of the membrane proteins. They can act as transport proteins, receptor proteins. They can also allow cell-to-cell -cell recognition during immune response, and they can also act as enzymes. That's basically what the function of the membrane proteins are. Of course, there are other functions of membrane proteins, but for the purpose of your exam, these four are sufficient if they require you to list it out. So, if you are asked to draw out a proper fluid mosaic membrane, the first thing that I would like to draw is the phospholipid bilayer. The second thing is the cholesterol, at least two cholesterol molecules, one for each layer. The third thing is the intrinsic and extrinsic proteins. And what I like to do is I just like to put an extra thing. Um, if the question is worth three marks, the phospholipid bilayer, cholesterol, and intrinsic extrinsic proteins are sufficient. However, if the question is worth four marks, at least put in one glycoprotein or one glycolipid that would be sufficient to give you the entirety of the full marks required for the exam. Another important thing to also know is, when you're talking about glycoprotein and glycolipid, the carbohydrate chain faces the outer part of the cell. The reason why it faces the outer part of the cell is because that's where the hormones are coming from. The hormones are coming from outside, so they have to receive the hormones with the carbohydrate chains facing the outer region. That's another important point that I would like you to also know. Other extra bits of information. Most membrane proteins are technically globular proteins. Globular meaning to say they are spherical. Okay. The green color parts of the proteins are actually made up of polar amino acids as well because they are facing the watery environment, which is either outside the cell or inside the cell. But the amino acids in the orange sections, which I've shaded for the protein, are comprised of non-polar amino acids. The reason is because they are the ones that can interact with the non-polar tails, which I've highlighted in yellow. So... That's just a bit of extra information that I would like you to know. So 
the membrane proteins have uh, amino acids which are polar, which will face the watery environment, and non-polar amino acids which will face the fatty acid tails due to hydrophobic interactions. These are just extra bits of information I would like you to know.